For the second part of the Unity tutorial for adding DepthKit Studio Clips to Unity, I'm going to focus on how to refine quality and performance for your DepthKit Studio Clips uh, by working inside of the DepthKit Studio Unity expansion package plugin. So if you remember from the last part of the tutorial, we got our clip set up by importing the packages and adding our assets to the project as well as then adding a prefab variant uh, to the scene. And we verified that it plays back fine. So now we want to focus on quality. The way DepthKit Studio works is that the geometry for the clip and the texturing are generated at runtime. This means the majority of the controls that affect the quality of the rendering of the clip happen inside of Unity and can be changed dynamically. So we're going to go through how to adjust the quality of the clip here with this three sensor capture, as well as focusing on aspects that will influence performance. So the first thing you'll notice is that with the default settings on this clip, there's some holes in the geometry, especially under the arms. So the, a lot of this has to do with the fact that uh, the default settings are designed for full body captures uh, that are 360, where this is a frontal oriented capture because it's a three camera capture. So let's start off quickly by going to the depth kit studio shader graph look and depth kit studio mesh source. And under experimental volume settings, we're going to click the load front bias defaults. These defaults are a good starting point for a three sensor capture and notice that these holes have gone away, but we do still have some small issues there. And before we get into uh, really tweaking these uh, settings, you'll notice that this is only one frame. It's in fact, it's the poster frame. And uh, we want to actually be able to scrub through the entirety of the clip so that we can make sure that we're setting settings uh, that are the best balance of quality for you know all moments within the clip. So I'm going to walk through uh, briefly setting up this clip on the Unity timeline so that you can scrub through it in edit mode while you're tweaking the settings. So in order to do that, uh, first I need to go to the asset store and import the default playables. And the Unity default playables, they uh, have a video player playable, which allows the Unity video player to be on the timeline. So I'll, if you search default playable in the asset store, you'll find this default playables asset, which is free and supported by Unity. And you can go ahead and download and import uh, that asset. And you'll notice that in this package, what we're looking for here is this video playable uh, behavior, this whole folder here. So we'll import that. Great. Now that that's in our project, we can go ahead and create a timeline just for this clip. So under create, I'll go to timeline. And I'll give it the same name as my clip. Uh, in more advanced use cases, you can add multiple clips to a timeline. But in this case, we'll just have this one timeline dedicated to this one clip. So I'll give it the same name. And then on my clip, I'm going to add a playable director component. And that component will reference my timeline. OK, great. And now. Uh, I can leave everything else to default there, and I'll double click on the timeline. And I like to hit this little lock button here so that as I click throughout the interface, it doesn't go away. And on this timeline, which is now attached to my uh, component, I'm going to create a video script playback track to control the playback of the video. Awesome. So that adds the, uh, the playback track. I'm going to click on these three dots here to add a element to this track from the video player. So I'll hit add from video player and lucky for us, there we go. The uh, video player connected to this asset on the prefab is ready there to be selected. So now I've created, uh, I've added that video player to be controlled by this video playback track. What I need to do second after that is connect the video player and the clip inside the video playable asset. So to do that, I'll add drag the prefab from the scene over to here. So it is referencing the prefab's video player component. And then I'll add 
the clip itself to the track. So now this video clip is added to this video player. And in order to actually enable scrubbing, I need to do two other small details that are easy to miss. So you'll notice, you know, off the bat, this doesn't scrub at first. Two things need to be adjusted. One, in order to get scrubbing to work on the timeline, under advanced settings on the depth kit clip, we need to disable the poster frame. And that allows the uh, video player to come through even in the editor. So disable poster frame once you've set up the video uh, script playback track. And then secondly, to scrub effectively, it's often important to leave a few uh, frames at the beginning of the playback track in order to scrub into the clip. And this is a product of uh, an idiosyncratic aspect of the Unity video player. And so you notice once you set those two things up, we can then scrub through the video clip. A few tips on scrubbing. Uh, one thing is that scrubbing forward is easier than scrubbing backwards. Scrubbing backwards, as you can see, doesn't really work very well on the video player. Another thing is that on some clips that are larger, uh, the scrubbing will be very slow. And often it's helpful to use a proxy video that has iframes encoded in every frame. And you can see our encoding guide for how to create those uh, proxy scrubbable assets. But for now, uh, this is working well enough for the purposes of the tutorial. So I'm going to stick with this asset. OK, so now we're able to scrub through the video track, which allows us to actually check if it's working, if the reconstruction settings are good for every frame of the video. So let's stop on a frame here that could use some work and start to improve uh, the surface reconstruction settings. So I'll stop here. This is a nice uh, frame because uh, there's some motion in the frame and there's also, you know, um, kind of high detail assets like the thumb here that we can uh, make sure are being recovered. You can see there's also some issues with the forehead here. Uh, and, you know, we can also control the fall back, fall off here to make it look differently based on our taste. So uh, let's start tweaking this asset. Let's dig into the details of the DepthKit Studio Mesh Source. This is the component that uh, all of the work for tweaking the, the quality of the settings will be done in. So to start with, um, the, the biggest uh, slider that you have here is the density of the volume. The density of the volume controls the number of voxels that are used to generate the surface. The denser it is, the higher quality surface you can get, but the biggest, bigger performance hit you'll have. Uh, one way to, to really see this density is to turn your scene into wireframe mode, and then you can actually see the wireframe. So notice this is currently at 100. As I turn it up to, say, 200, you'll see it gets very, very dense. Um, this can look a lot better. You can recover details better. But uh, oftentimes, uh, at the cost of performance, where if I were to turn it back down to 100, you know, it doesn't necessarily look that much worse. So we find that um, you know, 100 is a good starting point. If you're doing mobile, sometimes you can go as low as 50, which you can see at 50, we start to lose nose details. Uh, and it's very uh, much sparser. Uh, and if you're you know, doing an offline render, or quality is really important, you have the performance to do so. Um, you know, as high as 200 can be very effective. But for now, we're going to leave this one at 100, which is the good middle ground and, and the default. So the second set of settings uh, is really how is this surface generated? So we'll focus first on the geometry, and then secondly, we'll focus on the texturing, and then we'll talk a little bit about performance at the very end. So under the experimental volume settings, um, you'll find a number of different sliders. And really, the focus of, of your uh, settings here should be on three major sliders. Uh, first, the surface sensitivity. Second, the depth bias compensation. And then third, uh, we can focus on surface smoothing. The weight sliders are uh, for tweaking um, fine details, and uh, we won't get deep into them now. Um, leaving them on defaults as controlled by the load front bias defaults is uh, what's recommended for the sake of this tutorial. OK, so let's talk about surface sensitivity. The surface sensitivity defines 
how much wiggle room there is from the different perspectives in order to extract a surface. So for very good calibrations or uh, you know full body captures, you can get the surface sensitivity very low. But start to get it too low, and you'll see that misalignments in the sensor will will between the different sensors calibrated will start to cause holes in the capture, or potentially in areas of occlusion, you'll also get holes in the capture. Uh, in this in this case, underneath the arms uh, or underneath the chin. So whereas if you pull it too far in the opposite direction, you'll start to see uh, some other artifacts such as uh, geometry floating off of the subject, for instance, this little this issue with the chin here, um, and then the this back area gets extended and can be unsightly. So what we'd want to do is we want to find a balance uh, between too small, where we lose, start losing the surface, and too high, where we start getting unintended additional artifacts. You know, in this case, um, I can start looking under the the arms here to see really where that tolerance is and pull this out until there aren't any issues there. And then, of course, it's always helpful on my timeline to then scrub and see if that those settings um, caused issues elsewhere. Notice there's a little floater out here. We can get rid of that in other ways uh, using the surface smoothing. Next, we want to talk about the depth bias compensation. The depth bias compensation is a tool for uh, compensating for the issues that are inherent in the time of flight cameras on the Azure Connect. Without getting too, in, too much into details, the Azure Connect will always measure surfaces being a little bit further away than they actually are. And this is most pronounced on skin, human skin. This leads to a loss of details, particularly in the face, around noses, as well as uh, fingers. And so this slider actually pulls those surfaces back towards the cameras, compensating for this, uh, this issue. So you can notice if I turn this off, um, we start to lose some details in the thumbs here. Uh, and as I start to bring it back to, you know, the recommended value, which is about 0.8, those details start to come back. Generally, um, this is recommended to be left at default, but if you're having trouble uh, recovering a finger or a nose, turning this up past 0.8 is recommended. Finally, at the end of the uh, settings here, you can uh, turn on surface smoothing, and this helps get rid, rid of high frequency noise and small artifacts, as well as just kind of generally adding what can be seen as kind of a pleasing smoothness to the surface. So this should be done to taste only after all the other settings have been set. Uh, because if you over smooth, you can see you start to lose nose and feature details. So we recommend keeping this um, on, but quite low in order to just uh, kind of give the surface a, a, a lot, you know, a little bit of a more organic feel. So next, let's look at view-dependent blending. So in order to explain how the view-dependent blending works, I'd like to turn on the show per view color debug. And this is a debug view which shows how the different camera perspectives are being blended together. So in this case, we have three cameras, blue, green, and red. And the change in the blend is happening actually as the, the view is, is changing. This helps to match the viewing angle with the best texture solve uh, for that given moment. That, and it can change dynamically as the viewer moves through the scene. Inside of the uh, bl surface blending, there's one control that we recommend you change, where the others are, are more experimental. This is the view-dependent color blend weight. And this can be set to be higher or lower. And if you set it higher, you'll notice that uh, the blend happens more quickly. We recommend for three camera frontal bias captures to set this um, towards the higher side. And what this results in is a cleaner image for when you're looking straight on the capture. So now we can see what that looks like. Um, you know, as you move back and forth, you don't really see the blend. Um, but when you're straight on, uh, you get a really good view of the front the front camera. Uh, if it's turned down more, oftentimes you'll see blending artifacts like this right here, which are these other perspectives kind of coming in and competing uh, with that frontal view. 
So you can make those go away by turning this up and then really optimizing for the uh, front biased view. And then of course the blend happens over a much smaller area. You know, you can still see these in between artifacts like right there, but they happen only for a limited view. Seeing this again, turning on the uh, show per view debug, you can then see how that texture blending is taking place. Awesome. So now we have a very good looking capture uh, as we scrub through it. And now let's focus on the two parameters that really affect performance. Obviously we talked about uh, the volume density, but there are two other purely performance oriented uh, things to, uh, to keep in mind. The first is the volume bounds. You can see this white box. And the second is the surface buffer capacity. So the surface buffer capacity controls the number of triangles that are available to be drawn at any given moment. And you want to make sure this is as low as possible without being too low. So I'll click this set surface buffer capacity and you can see it gets set to 80,000. And this is based on the current sample of the clip. It looks at the number of triangles being drawn for this individual frame, pads it by a little bit and then sets this value. Generally when you hit set surface buffer capacity it will work for the entire clip. And if you start seeing parts of the clip missing, you can increase it. Now let's set the volume bounds. So the volume bounds should be as close to the capture as possible without uh, clipping it. So here we know we can set this further back. We can set this closer. And uh, since Corey's not jumping here at all, I can set this right at the top of his head. Uh, it can also be used to clip the feet to the floor. So make sure Corey's feet are properly on the floor and then set the volume bounds to right where his feet are without floating. And then the same way I can set the sides. So as you move this in, you are saving computation by uh, tightening the volume bounds and not having to compute those, that empty space. And you'll want to scrub through your clip after setting this to make sure that in no cases are you clipping with those volume bounds. Great, and that's it. Now your project is set up and your clips are looking good and optimized.